Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, many of you uh, out there uh, may know me. Uh, welcome to you. Uh, my name is Nicholas Saul, uh, and uh, I'm here uh, as Director of Arts and Humanities at the Institute of Advanced Study to introduce our guest lecturer uh, this evening. It's a pleasure and an honour this evening to introduce Professor Sandra Sam of the Catholic University of America, Washington, D.C. Professor Sham is working with Nicholas Blomley, Chris Douglish, Nicole Graham and Anna Stanio uh, on the large and exciting uh, project um, Negotiating Landscapes of Rights, organized by Chris Gerard of Archaeology and Henry Jones of Law, which is looking from many interdisciplinary angles the interplay of memory, heritage, practice, and right in determining, in determining the ownership and use of common land over thousands of years and numerous cultures and people. Professor Sham is eminently and almost uniquely quite well qualified to do this. He not only possesses the highest academic qualifications in cultural anthropology and archaeology, which have taken her to Maryland, Penn State, Stanford, Washington. She's also labored fruitfully in the US Department of State and the US Agency for International Development, no less. The major themes, the importance of cultural heritage, subaltern and indigenous peoples, gender equality and narratives of extremism, have taken her in the field to Palestine, the West Bank, and Gaza, Jerusalem, Jordan, Negev Desert, and the Kurdish terrains in eastern Turkey, also Afghanistan, Morocco, Oman, Yemen, and many other theatres of dispute. The list of distinguished publications is far too long to do justice to here. Suffice it to say that her latest monograph is of immediate interest, and not only to Middle and Far Eastern people, but also to those in the privileged West. It's called Extremism, Ancient and Modern, Insurgency, Terror and Empire in the Middle East. Published by Routledge in 2018. Today, Professor Sham's theme is the interface of between communal bonding before and after the rise of Islam, before and after the foundation of Israel, across the transition from pastoral agriculture. So without further ado, to Professor Sandra Sham, the title, Zabia, the Code of the Desert. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, very kind introduction. And um, uh, I appreciate that you actually are aware of all of those uh, different facets of my career. Uh, I, I also appreciate the support of the IAS and all of the fruitful conversations we've been having in the past uh, couple of months. Uh, today's subject uh, is something that's very close to um, close to my heart, I guess you would say. Um, and uh, I would say that my my first uh, encounter with the Bedouin of the Niqab or the Negev was about 25 years ago. I had uh, worked in Jordan, actually, on a prehistoric site, but uh, came to live in Jerusalem uh, to work there at a museum. And uh, during that time period, there was a demonstration uh, that related to the Jahalim Bedouin, who were, who were being moved out of their, uh, their homes in the Judean Desert and moved to a place in the Negev Desert. It was the fourth time they were being moved in order to make way for and as for the the expansion of the settlement of Male Adunim. So uh, we, uh, I and my uh, my colleagues, uh, we had a uh, not a particularly uh, uh, well peopled protest against this, but we came out and supported the Bedouin, uh, and um, but to no avail as it turned out. But uh, at least we showed up. But the, the main thing I remember about that, and I took a photograph of it, was the, the Bedouin man who held up a sign, Abraham was a nomad. And to me, that sort of encapsulized a lot of things I think that people 
people think about the Bedouin in the Middle East, um, uh, and Israelis in particular tend to uh, compare Bedouin to, to biblical peoples, which uh, actually is, uh, is the source of their ambivalence about, uh, about Bedouin. On the one hand, they are, they are moved around um, uh, many times, uh, displaced uh, many times, uh, but on the other, there are plenty of Israelis, particularly Israeli anthropologists, who really admire them because they think these are the, the people that represent biblical people, them, uh, which is very important, of course, in the Israeli culture. But um, I wanted to begin with this sort of moving, uh, <laughs> moving photograph of desert sands, which sort of uh, I, it's a little spocky and a little and. Um, Romantic at the same time, I guess, when most people think of the deserts, especially the deserts of the Middle East. Uh, since nomadism and semi pastoral nomadism began, which by most calculations was after the advent uh, of farming and settled life in the Neolithic period, um, there, there are a number of scholars who believe that animals might have been domesticated earlier. Certainly, the dog was domesticated earlier than any of the uh, animals we normally associate with pastoralism. Dogs are very important in Bedouin life, so it's rather interesting that the Middle East probably uh, was the place where dogs were first domesticated. And throughout Middle Eastern history, the dwellers of the Badia, the wilderness, have been feared and uh, harried by town and city dwellers. As states develop, the contrast between the desert and the stone, um, as, as the saying goes, uh, grew and transformed into uh, mutual antagonism. In spite of the fact that most archaeologists view Middle Eastern subsistence strategies as alternating cycles of nomadization and sedentarization, uh, which is very difficult to pronounce, but this is actually the, the term that's used. Desert dwellers of the ancient Middle East were envied as well as feared by farmers, and the farmers in turn were resented by the Badawi as selfish and inhospitable and uh, uncultured in, in their view. <laughs> Un, not necessarily uncivilized, but uncultured. Uh, the desert dwellers of the ancient Middle East were envied as well as feared by farmers, and the farmers in turn were resented, um, as I mentioned before. Uh, sorry. And the tension is reflected clearly in the uh, Mukadima of Ibn Khaldun, who alternately praises Bedouin culture as a reservoir of civilization, which is high praise indeed, but also denounces the Bedouin as a savage nation bent on destroying everything that civilization has built. Okay, this is from Rosenthal's well-known translation of the Mukadima, um, which is probably the one most people are acquainted with if they studied Ibn Khaldun. And uh, just to go through some of the statements um, uh, translated, of course, um, about Asabia in, um, in Ibn Khaldun's Mukadima, uh, the statement that whenever group feeling is truly form formidable and it's uh, kept in pure soil, uh, that um, that descent and blood will come together and make uh, Asabia more more effective. Uh, this is um, translated generally as group feeling in uh, in the translation uh, of uh, uh, in Rosenthal's translation. So you know, for our purposes, group feeling. Other terms will be used um, instead of the Arabic term, which. Ibn Khaldun never really defined. Um, now he really felt that this group feeling resulted only from a blood relationship, which is actually a very traditional Bedouin view. So nowadays people uh, in Arab countries will actually use this to refer to nationalism and the group, uh, these ties that bind groups together in general and not necessarily relatives. Uh, but the early definition of the term, and uh, Ibn Khaldun by no means invented this, uh, it was um, before his work, uh, it was a term that was used to connote prejudice uh, or uh, very um, strong group solidarity, excluding other groups, of course, or being antagonistic to other groups, um, which is basically translates to tribalism as uh, nowadays. So, but he felt that uh, really it was this group feeling that led to civilization and led to the advent of civilization in the Middle East. And he also distinguishes the, what you might say, the objectionable uh, use of the term to denote prejudice or bias. Um, 
and uh, and really translates it more as a positive uh, positive feeling that knits people together. And of course, we consider this again the reservoir of civilization. Um, as the code of the desert, uh, th these are statements that really establishes this term as uh, as being the basis for Bedouin law, for Bedouin traditions. Uh, the desert is the basis and reservoir of civilization in cities, as I mentioned before. Uh, he also felt that Bedouins are closer to being good than sedentary people, although he calls them the savage nation, uh, ambivalence again, and more disposed to courage than sedentary people, which of course, um, because Bedouin have been known since um, since people first started writing about Bedouin as uh, people who were engaged in constant conflicts. So courage, of course, would be a commodity that would be much valued. And um, and again, various things that I've already gone over uh, about his, his uh, view of what Bedouin life was like. But of course, it's uh, the term, again, as I mentioned, uh, was pre-Islamic. And uh, we can see this in the pre-Islamic poetry of Jared ibn Asima. And uh, he's, he's a really very interesting poet because he was living at the time in which um, the Arabian Peninsula and, um, and the Arab, uh, what we now know as the Arab countries were, were converting from paganism to Islam. And he's often considered to be an anti-Islamic poet. But uh, he really does encapsulate the feeling of uh, tribal cohesion in his poetry, and this is one of my favorites. And uh, the, last, uh, the last sentence um, puzzled me for a time, but uh, I think what he was trying to say, and this is, this is very much um, in keeping with the tribal group feeling that uh, Asadia is, um, thus we have divided time in two between us and our foe till not a day goes by when we're not in one half or the other. And essentially this is uh, a, a little, poetic uh, here in terms of uh, hard to parse, but I think uh, it, eventually I came to realize that what he was saying was that um, either we were living our own lives for half, for half of our time, but the other half of our time we were, fight, we were fighting with others to preserve our own way of living. And modern proverbs, uh, these are translated by Clinton Bailey, uh, who is actually a very good scholar of the Bedouin, but his translation of Bedouin poetry, he sort of makes a kind of uh, um, difficult, I, I would say, effort to make it rhyme and have Western leaders. So actually, would, it, it seems a little silly to see this, the, the way it's written here, because uh, it does look very Western in terms of the rhyme and meter, and that is really not a, a, a true translation of Bedouin poetry. But this clearly illustrates the point about group feeling. Be careful to suffer your clansman's mistake. Don't hold him a foe in your heart, though it ache. <laughs> Any shame on your clansman hurts you in its wake. Uh, yes, this, you can see what I mean about tortured rhyme. And he's also, also translated um, poet, um, Bedouin proverbs the in use in the modern period. Uh, that illustrate this concept. When one turns to his clansman, even if he's wrong, he's not. The clansman, of course. There's no gain in a clan whose rights get lost through dissension. Um, that's fairly clear. And the greatest concern is one killing one's clansman, which of course is uh, definitely a part of the uh, of the, the establishment of Asadia as uh, as the basis for Bedouin life and tradition. Um, I would have to say um, the irony of using Orientalist paintings to illustrate my thoughts on the Bedouin is not lost on me, but uh, somehow it, it, it seems fitting to include the Western visions of what the Bedouin were like. Uh, uh, and the paintings, of course, illustrate this most clearly. This is the Egyptian uh, a painting by Leon Collier of the Egyptian expedition under the orders of Bonaparte, who can probably be seen as a shadow in the background the shadow of Western civilization on the Orient. Uh, as the Ottoman Empire was unraveling, images of the Bedouin began to proliferate in European paintings. Uh, and also 
a little less so in the United States, but there is a notable exception of John Singer Sargent, who had uh, actually very lively paintings of the Bedouin that were, uh, I would have difficulty calling them Orientalist, but uh, uh, not quite like the European paintings. Um, having earlier been stimulated by no Napoleon's invasion of the Middle East and North Africa, this interest was later spurred by Western nations who were eager to claim these territories in the Middle East and North Africa, um, either, either by conquest or influence. And the Bedouin's traditional way of life, which is purportedly untouched by modernity, was an ideal subject for painting in this new age. Uh, the paintings that position the Bedouin either before their tents, almost always, or on the road, or on camels, or on, on horses, uh, began to replace the kind of Orientalist fantasies you see early in the Orientalist painting period of, uh, of harems, uh, which they were popular subjects, or harem dwellers, if you will. Um, so uh, this vision of Middle East Bedouin life uh, uh, began to be the way people started to think about Middle Eastern culture in general in the West. That's another Orientalist painting. Uh, but uh, a little more, uh, a little more homey, I guess, if you will. <clears throat> this is by uh, Ludwig Hans Fischer, and uh, this is actually a painting of the Sinai Bedouin. Uh, Israelis um, have had something of a romance with Bedouin life, as I mentioned before, even as their government seeks to gradually destroy it. Uh, this is something that the Bedouin themselves understandably have difficulty in comprehending. And for simplistic observers, the Bedouin are a conundrum. Their practice is considered fractious, violent, but invariably hospitable and generous. But some Israelis will readily admit that they feel a strong affinity for them as a people who have lived in the deserts of Palestine and Arabia for centuries. Um, there are two other Israelis, uh, that is, Clinton Bailey for one. Uh, they are reminiscent of biblical patriarchs, which I think is kind of a misinformed view. Uh, uh, Bailey wrote an entire book about uh, how the Bedouin exemplify what the, the biblical way of life was like, and I think it was uh, it was it was not well received in the Middle Eastern uh, <clears throat> in the journals of Middle Eastern history, uh, pri uh, uh, primarily because that's sort of a, a very uh, overdrawn uh, kind of comparison. And um, as one Bedouin chief that is known to have said to some anthropologist colleagues of mine who wrote in their article, what I can't understand is why these Israelis have to write about how we are so much like they used to be when they lived in their holy book. We never could afford to just wander around with flocks like that, whatever government rules us at the moment. Can't they write about us as we really are? Well, the, the point of this, of course, is that um, the Bedouin of the Negev in particular, and uh, of uh, what are sometimes referred to as Bible land, uh, were actually not fully nomadic. They were semi-nomadic. And um, camel, camel pastoralism, uh, only in certain pockets of the Bedouin, uh, but certainly camel pastoralism, pastoralism in, the, uh, in the Negev was, uh, was quite rare, the Nakab, actually, in Arabic. Um, but um, I might mention that uh, another Isra kind of Israeli view of the Bedouin is actually a little more insidious, and that's the one offered by Raphael Patai, another Israeli anthropologist. Again, there are so many that have written about the Bedouin that's rather interesting and somewhat ironic. Uh, his view is that the Arab proclivity toward conflict was exported to all the territories that became Arabized or at least Islamicized and it became a common feature of all Islamic peoples. Uh, well, in this particular case, um, Fatai's view uh, was even more insidious for the fact that uh, uh, it was adopted by the United States Army, and uh, especially uh, when conducting uh, their torture campaign against uh, Iraqis. Uh, and, um, and actually, it was, it was said to be required reading for the, uh, for the military who ran of the infamous Abu Ghraib prison. Okay. The Bedouins have inhabited the deserts of the Middle East and the Arabian Gulf for very many centuries. Uh, it's very difficult to construct their history. 
Uh, they, they have lived in the Negev Desert at least as far back as the seventh century and probably before. Uh, the tribal groups, of course, have shifted over the years, but never to the extent that an entire Bedouin tribal confederation, a completely different cultural grouping, was completely displaced by another completely different unrelated cultural grouping. Um, so this is, um, so it's over, uh, uh, Israeli historians tend to uh, over-exaggerate the fact that the same, the tribes who live in Maqab now are not, the, not exactly the same tribes who lived there 500 years ago. Uh, this, uh, I will talk about why this is somehow important, but uh, this is one of the arguments that they make. And it's based on a ge genealogical view of history that anth anthropologists will generally reject anyway. It's also based upon a persistent historical trope in the Middle East history of empty land. And by that, I mean, uh, if, you were, if you were teaching archaeology that in any way uh, impacts on Bible lands, um, you have to deal with the fact that much archaeology uh, believed that after the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, the land was emptied out of citizens, which is nonsensical and uh, actually uh, disproven by the archaeological evidence. Uh, so that's the first myth of the empty land. The second is that the Romans similarly emptied out this area and no one was left. And again, you know, they're, they're, it, it is a really strange myth to think, think of it, but uh, this, is, this is pretty common. There was a, a, an early um, uh, nationalist book that, uh, that, for the, that the Israeli government embraced called From Time Immemorial, which talked about uh, the fact that Palestine actually had very few villages and very few people when, uh, when, the, um, when, when Jews from Europe and um, later on, the Arab countries started to settle in the area. And of course, again, it's a rather strange view that most anthropologists would find extremely unbelievable. So under Cole's definition of Bedouin um, as a way of life, more than ethnicity, one could say that the Bedouin way of life extends back to the late Neolithic or Calvary. Again, even the Bedouin themselves don't say, uh, uh, the better one that I I co co corroborate with, who are admittedly uh, academic, but uh, they do not see themselves as a specific type of ethnicity, race, uh, group of people um, that we ordinarily think of uh, as as uh, as making up nation states. They think of themselves as as the uh, progenitors and the preservers of a certain way of life the way of life of uh, semi-nomadism -nomad and herding sheep and goats, which made, um, made their pastoralist subsistence strategy possible. Going back as far as uh, one can, 200,000 rock art gravings have been found in the Nakab Desert that dates back at least 5,000 years or possibly even older. Human occupation in this region actually can be traced even further back uh, to, the, to the Paleolithic and the first waves of migration out of Africa. Uh, geographically, uh, many people may know this, but geographically, the Jordan Valley, which runs through Palestine and kind of separates Jordan from Israel today to some extent and the West Bank, uh, the Jordan River and the Jordan River Valley are an extension of the African Rift Valley. Uh, which actually made it quite easy for uh, for early modern humans and even um, even hominids that um, uh, before them to to actually come up and populate the Near East from from Africa where they evolved. Human um, cat, herd herding, that is the herding of sheep and goats, was introduced to the region about eight thousand years ago, and it became an important economic base. Um, from the early Bronze Age to um, the fourth millennium before present and onwards, and is still practiced in, in some of the contemporary Bedouin communities, obviously. Um, uh, I used to actually uh, see herds of sheep and goats being, uh, being brought into the city of Jerusalem to empty lots. Uh, there were a number of empty lots in Jerusalem in the days where I lived there, and uh, I, would, I would really enjoy seeing <laughs> Same people actually using them for for sheep and goat herds, herds. So, but that doesn't happen much anymore. Um, we, going back to the ancient, the most ancient settlements we know of that may characterize the beginning of the Bedouin in the Nakab 
ancient Arad and Beersheba, both of which go back to, again, the early Bronze Age. And, and, um, and archaeologists have, uh, have excavated both of these sites extensively. And uh, archaeologist Steve Rosen in particular feels that the, the dwellings in these sites were actually uh, sort of a permanent version of a Bedouin tent. That's the way he looked at uh, the dwellings that he was excavating, which is an interesting concept uh, uh, that these really were built by settled Bedouins. They, um, the main changes in Middle Eastern and Bedouin way of life occurred in the uh, late Bronze to early Iron, Iron Age, um, when people were able to create plastered cisterns that would hold water, rainwater better, because the Bedouin actually did engage in runoff farming from a very early period. Um, also, the use of terraces for farming, which in some hilly areas of the, of the Nakab uh, are quite useful. And then there is the uh, quote invention of the camel. <laughs> I, I, I would not say the camel was ever truly domesticated, but it's a very late domesticate. It didn't come along until uh, around 1200 BC, maybe a little before. So uh, the, what we think of as the quintessential animal of Bedouin life was actually uh, domesticated much later than, um, than sheep and goat, which are much more important. Now, during colonial rule, there was, in fact, a number of Bedouin uh, revolts, uh, a, a number of and Bedouin resistance to British government. Um, but to peak during the Great, Re Great Revolt of 1936. And um, they played an important administrative role in uh, later on in managing uh, Palestine's southern district, particularly the Bedouin of the Maghab. Um, findings from British and Israeli archives and from interviews conducted um, in the Nakab with key individuals um, have, um, in, suggest that between 1917 and 1948, the Bedouin resisted the British authorities through various forms and mechanisms. And in the modern period, even though the Bedouin are considered traditionally fractious, contentious, violent sometimes, uh, they're also known in the modern period for not having resisted colonial rule, including, I guess, in, according to some people, the colonial rule of the current current government in Israel. But actually, land and tribe uh, were an immutable bond in Bedouin life, and and Western cultures they have. They've really misunderstood uh, the relationship the Bedouin have to the land. And I think this is misunderstood for nomads and semi-nomads throughout the world. I mean, basically, because you, uh, you move frequently does not mean that you do not have a sense of, uh, of ownership of the land. It's a common ownership. Uh, later on in the history of the Bedouin, it was ascribed to people on the basis of their clan membership. Um, to, to various plans for them to use for farming and also for uh, for for periodically moving herds from uh, higher to low ground and then back again. Um, and this way of life um, actually actually uh, made the land more important rather than uh, than less important to them because the territory was marked clearly. Uh, people uh, people stood, uh, steered clear. From the territory of other tribes, and uh, they really established their um, their territorial rights to certain pieces of land very clearly in a traditional manner. However, um, the problem when Western cultures came into this part of the world, uh, first the British, of course, and then the Israelis, uh, the the rights to the land that the Bedouin had that they had observed the age-old rights. Um, that they had, had observed the, uh, being attributed to clans uh, were not reduced to any sort of formal uh, paper. And, uh, and later on, uh, when Israel attempted to, um, to settle the Bedouin uh, into various restricted lands and would not actually accept the Bedouin right to, uh, to move around within a specific territory, uh, they established a, uh, in 1969, a settlement or um, ordinance uh, that gave the government the right to confiscate 
lands, uh, lands that the Ottoman Empire had declared dead lands, that is uh, really the places where the Bedouin lived. And there were a number of reasons why they, ne they failed to register their land with the Ottoman Empire, uh, with the British mandate, and then again, by the time the Israeli government moved in, there was very little to demonstrate what their traditional land rights were. Uh, they utilized the traditional ownership system and saw no need for official registration, and they historically cooperated with state authorities, and state authorities um, uh, in general start recognize this. Later on in the Ottoman period, of course, they began to get a little more um, um, res restrictive about the use of the land in within their imperial boundaries, but uh, for the most part, they recognized this before the Israeli government was established. Uh, the Bedouin also did, were not really familiar with registration procedures. It was not something that was endemic to their culture, of course. And uh, they also feared that registering their land would create problems. First of all, it would give the authorities too much control over them, and they might inadvertently, of course, register the lands of their uh, their of other tribal groups, which would create a great deal of dissension. Um, and they and finally, they really didn't have they really were not well acquainted by either the Ottomans or the Israeli government with the, the idea of registering land. And I'm not sure that it's even even well accepted today, although they've sort of acquiesced to the Western point of view that one has to establish control over a certain piece of land. But uh, in today's Bedouin world, uh, in the Nakab today, actually, this is a problem. Uh, it's um, They're uh, being moved into certain restricted areas and uh, the, these restricted areas actually have few, uh, few real uh, utilities, schools, or any of the things you need to, to settle people down. They're just sort of designated as townships that the, the Bedouin of the Nakab are supposed to move to. But um, they, it is, um, pardon me, I get a bit of a cold, but, um, uh, but it is uh, actually, uh, difficult for people, of course, to move into these townships and to accept the sedentary way of life without any of the, uh, the comforts of a sedentary way of life. So consequently, most Bedouin of the Nakab today live in informal settlements, that is, ones they've established themselves, uh, which are periodically torn down by the, uh, the Israeli military, as you can see in this particular picture. Um, another thing that has come up with respect to the Bedouin claim to the land uh, is that, um, pardon me, that a, num a number of uh, Israeli government anthropologists, believe me, there is such a thing, it sounds antithetical, but there, uh, there, these are anthropologists who, who work for the government uh, who are trying to establish um, the fact that the Bedouins are not indigenous people. Uh, it sounds rather ridiculous in, in a way, because uh, the fact is one associates this part of the world with Bedouin uh, as far back in history as uh, it, as most of us um, think of, but um, essentially they're, they, the idea of, in, uh, of them not being indigenous, of course, is, um, is a way to restrict their rights to the land. Also, uh, the protection of uh, international conventions on indigenous peoples has come into play as well. So this is um, a current uh, a current argument being made, uh, uh, which is kind of a corollary to the argument that they were not at all tied to the land. Uh, so uh, this effort, of course, is um, has not actually discouraged Bedouin from settling in these informal settlements. And, and the attempt to uh, control Bedouin life uh, on the part of the Israeli government modernized or westernized them had a very curious effect. For example, um, it was very early, and of course, um, when as soon as the government was established, they made polygyny uh, actually a um, a crime, and um, and the Palestinian population in general actually was not really practicing polyg polygyny much of the time, but the Bedouin were and continue to do so, and actually, that for a while, uh, they actually acquiesced to the federal, uh, to the Israeli government's uh, rule on polygyny, but uh, again, in recent years, in the last two decades or so, 
to practice it more and more. And uh, it's really related to this whole idea of uh, create of demography is destiny. And this is something uh, that, that Israelis believe in strongly that uh, that they need to increase the population so that they are always the majority in the, in the land that they occupy. Uh, and other nation states do this as well. And the Bedouins have started to adopt that point of view that they have to have as many children as possible uh, in order to uh, in order to establish their presence on the land. So it's a rather curious sort of adoption of the Israeli Western models uh, to Bedouin life. Uh, but the meaning that what this, what this sort of um, um, strange juxtaposition of tradition and modernity has accomplished is that today uh, there is um, a great deal of uh, conflict within Bedouin communities and uh, they have established their own system of adjudication. The Israeli government does not enter these communities in order to enforce any laws. So this again, of course, uh, prompts people to want to have more children in order to establish that the more children you have, the more authority you have or the more power you have in the community. So, uh, so these, these are rather strange tensions between the state and, um, and, the, and Bedouin semi-nomadic life that actually calls up both historical practices that they that practiced far in the past and maybe may have uh, not done so at, uh, starting with the, uh, the beginning of the Israeli government and, um, and also uh, a, a modern preoccupation with establishing your presence in the land and your ownership of the land. Um, the land I might mention in, in conclusion, uh, the land of Israel is actually 93% of the land is uh, held in trust for the Jewish people. Um, it is not a typical trust as we think of it because um, it violates the law against perpetuity, which I probably uh, I won't explain much further because it's getting excessively legalistic, but uh, the set, only 7% of the land is set aside for anybody to own it. And as the Bedouins, of course, grow more populous, that 7% and the ways of allocating it become more and more important. And of course, at this point, there is really not enough room in the Nakba left for, for the Bedouin to really maintain their traditional way of life. So with that, I have some time for some questions. Thank you so much, Sandra. That was marvelously informative. I enjoyed every minute of that. Uh, we've we've got uh, fifteen minutes or so for uh, for questions. Um, uh, our view to our viewers uh, and listeners out there. Uh, those of us who may not be terribly aware of our procedures, uh, you will find on your Zoom uh, screen at home uh, a Q and A function. And the procedure is uh, that you submit a written question, please, uh, to this Q and A list, which I'm staring at intently now, uh, and. Uh, 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 I will then uh, pass them on uh, to uh, to uh, to, uh, to uh, Sandra, who I believe also uh, can read them herself. Is that correct, Sandra? Um, yes. Um, well, I only see one, actually. No, I don't see that. Uh, question and answer. Um, so, while people are limbering up uh, yeah. for questions, yeah, I'm, I'm oh, yes, here we are. Here's one from Nicholas Bromley. Can you please? Speak more on the Bedouin resistance to contemporary uh, Israeli land policy. Um, I'm sorry, what, uh, what was said? I, I heard part of that question um, uh, about Bedouin resistance, um, more on the Bedouin resistance and Israeli land policy. Right. Oh, okay. Um, well, actually, this is a, a subject that I've studied for quite some time. Uh, uh, the, the indigenous argument uh, that I mentioned is actually a recent um, uh, sort of weapon in, in the arsenal uh, that's uh, calling for the displacement of the Bedouin from the Negev. Uh, and so the reason why um, the Israelis actually want Bedouin to settle in specific demarcated, very small territories in the Nakab de uh, Desert is because 
uh, the desert is uh, is being developed. Um, there, Beersheba is beginning to be a very large city, and also the military uh, wants to occupy a, a good part of the desert. The resistance, um, the resistance is actually a rather strange, uh, strange thing because um, there was obviously they engaged in violent up, uh, uprising, uh, uprisings in the past but not really anything to speak of today. And at first the Bedouin were very acquiescent to Israeli rule. And even it was even very common for Bedouin to join the Israeli army. It is not possible for Palestinians to join the Israeli army. They're not permitted, but the Bedouin were permitted to join because they were willing to accept um, all of the rules and of the military. And, um, and they, were not, um, they were not really um, uh, antagonistic towards Israeli government rule, which is really an opportunity that was lost by the Israeli government to, to, to further develop this relationship and make it a little more, um, um, little more con uh, congenial, I guess, to, um, to use a strange word, but, uh, but uh, they really did not do that. Basically what they did is just start to restrict the land more and more because again, this age-old misunderstanding of the Bedouin relationship to the land. Um, oh, they don't really care about it because they move around and they don't really have any idea about where they're going. <laughs> and uh, and uh, also um, later on, because of the need for the uh, for the modern Israeli state to establish to, to use the land for various purposes. So the resistance is really sort of, uh, again, it's a cultural resistance today. It's the establishment of these informal settlements uh, the resurgence of things like uh, polygyny, which is uh, rather interesting. A lot of people have written about this in, in Nakab Bedouin life. Um, uh, even in, across the river in Jordan, polygyny is dying out, mainly because you know, modern, modern life makes it very expensive. But uh, not in the Nakab, it's growing. <laughs> so, uh, and it's for political reasons mainly rather than cultural ones. So, but so the resistance is, uh, I would say, Passive resistance in a way, nonviolent. Okay, the uh, questions are pouring in now, uh, <laughs> Sandra. Here's one from Gillian Fulger. I'll try to take them in the uh, in the order they came in. What's the current population and land area in which they in which they live? What's the current land area in which they live? You mean in terms of kilometers or or? or uh... Population and uh, land area, yeah. Uh, the popu I, I actually don't know the, the numbers. Um, I, I'm usually not a numbers person, so I, I, I can certainly uh, uh, get back to you on that because uh, uh, it's, uh, I would have to get the current figures. Um, uh, but the land area, of course, is... Um, I would say the, uh, the population of the Bedouin uh, would make their occupation of the land that has been allotted to them uh, probably almost as crowded as Gaza, <laughs> which is essentially the most crowded place on earth, I think, one of the most crowded places, places on earth. Uh, so, um, uh, so it's, um, again, I'm sorry, I don't have the, have the numbers, but um, uh, let's see, I have a, a question. Um, general, oh, code versus rights. Well, obviously code and laws have uh, very different points of view. The very different definitions in uh, in Western culture. Um, really, I, I, I refer to uh, the the tribal feeling, the group feeling, as uh, as being a code because it underlies Bedouin tradition. Uh, as far as Bedouin law goes, uh, I'm not sure we would consider it law within a traditional Western sense. Uh, it's uh, it's sort of adjudication by case, uh, mediation. Uh, it, it, uh, all, all there's no acceptance of uh, precedence, except for the precedence of one having established a certain territory uh, related to one's particular plan. But uh, beyond that, um, um, I, did, I don't think we would look at this as law in the traditional sense. There is a very good, uh, there are a number of very good uh, books on, uh, on Bedouin laws, which is fairly complex. And I would actually say that it's, uh, as an archaeologist, it's quite akin to what the ancient Egyptian law was like. Uh, unlike Mesopotamian law, they didn't really establish uh, law codes like Hammurabi, but actually just it was a case by case basis. Um, well, as things were judged on a case by case basis. And of course, Pharaoh was the ultimate law. Uh, so, um, 
Yeah, I, essentially that's why I did avoid um, uh, trying to define that in a traditional way it, it is thought of. Okay, that was, uh, that was from Henry Jones, by the way. The next one up is from uh, uh, Mehmet Azutai, uh, and he says, uh, could we consider Sabia as the political or philosophical foundation of the modern Arab nationalism uh, emerging in the, the beginning of the 20th century? Yeah, that, I, well, yes, I, that is what, I, what I've always understood in terms of, um, uh, and I think it's looked at this way by um, modern Arab nation states. Um, but um, in the Nakab, I think it has a different sort of meaning, just mainly because we're not talking about um, a modern Arab nation state. So, uh, there are people who are in control of um, uh, control of their, even the territory that they live in. So, I mean, they, uh, it, it has a different kind of meaning, but I, I do understand the nationalist meaning. It's, uh, it hasn't been discarded entirely because uh, because it fairly easily translates into nationalism, uh, modern nationalism in some ways. Ethnic, it's not ethnic nationalism. Again, the, the better one are not ethnic groups, but uh, I guess tradition, <laughs> traditional nationalism and some hearkening back to a way of life that uh, people don't actually live in some, these countries um, anymore. Uh, I lived in Jordan for a while where this, it, they have an interesting relationship to the Bedouin that is different from these, obviously different from Israelis, but um, Jordanians consider themselves, so, uh, well, there's a, the majority of the population in Jordan is Palestinian, which creates uh, an issue, a definite issue. But um, the, the Jordanians, um, uh, Jord, uh, what we would call um, uh, East Bank Jordanians, <laughs> I uh, think of themselves as Bedouin, even though uh, most of them were settled into towns and cities, uh, but they're still Bedouin out in, out in urban areas. And uh, they have a very strong relationship to this tradition, regardless of whether they live in a city or not. And, um, uh, and the, the, the tradition is, uh, is upheld in national uh, uh, in national celebrations. Um, I'm sure that some people remember that King Hussein, in order to um, preside over national celebrations, would always wear Bedouin dress, uh, even though he dressed like a Westerner everywhere else in the world. Uh, and so it, this, this, it, it's very strongly upheld by modern nationalism in Jordan. But of course, in the Negev, it would be something quite different. Okay, the next one is uh, is um, a splendidly uh, hypotactic nested question from my colleague Rob Barton. He says, can you tell us a little about how uh, Bedouin subsistence and socioeconomics have changed in recent times and the extent to which they're integrating into neighboring groups or not? And whether this is a cause of tension within the community. For example, if uh, elders see a breakdown of tradition uh, and group coherence. Yeah, I, um, definitely, I, I, I agree with um, the, the latter, that there, there has been a breakdown because of the internal tensions that are created by the external problems. Um, I, it, and trying to explain group feeling to me, actually, one of my Bedouin colleagues uh, told me that uh, he, when he was in Israel last, there was the problem. Uh, I think basically uh, in, at a celebrate at a social celebration, two, two different groups, uh, recognized tribal groups, um, got into and um, members uh, some members of those groups got into an argument that turned into violence. And uh, of course, the men or, or the males from one of the particular groups came in to reinforce their 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 clansmen, and, uh, and it, it was like something out of uh, out of the past in some ways. And then he ended by saying, "And this is why we we uh, we practice polygyny more today." <laughs> so so I, I I know that sounds strange, but I think he was trying to make the point that um, that since the Israeli government wouldn't help police their area. That they had to do it for themselves by having as many sons as possible, which is uh, an interesting, an interesting way of explaining it. Um, so, what was the second part of the question? Sorry. The, There's a cause of tension uh, within the community. For example, if elders see a breakdown of tradition and yeah. group coherence. 
Yeah, I think it, I think it's simultaneously a breakdown of tradition and a revival of traditions that people had rejected in the past. Um, um, and polygyny is one of them. There are some others, of course. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's still not um, registering land is uh, well, they can't and it's prevented from doing so uh, by the current government. But um, it is still not um, a, a formal formal uh, recognition, any kind of written recognition, contractual, in, you know, even if they, it's not recognized by the state. Uh, this this kind of way of occupying land is still not practiced so much, uh, even though um, I mean, most Bedouin I know who are living in the Maqab now that are, uh, have built houses uh, in informal settlements, even though there is a fear that they will be torn down. Um, and um, and it, it's um, some have built houses in formal settlements, uh, which makes more sense <laughs> because they're, they're more secure there. Uh, but it, it's really just uh, it, it, it's um, modernism has imposed a lot of things. Uh, it's, uh, of course, they have to learn Hebrew in schools as well as English. So there are three languages that Bedouin are supposed to be fluent in. Uh, and um, because the school, school system is provided by the Israeli government. Uh, so most of the Bedouin scholars that I know speak all three languages pretty fluently, but I think it imposes a hardship on people who, who um, may not be able to get that kind of education. Okay, they're still coming in, uh, uh, Sandra, uh, I'm afraid. Um, uh, I've got uh, a couple more questions uh, for you now. One from uh, Derek Kennett. Um, uh, uh, Derek notes that some recent uh, archaeological literature from southeastern and southern Arabia mm -hmm. has applied the Kaldurian concept of Zabia, a Bronze Age archaeology, using it to explain the absence of evidence of hierarchical social structures. And he mentions the name McGee and McCorriston. Oh, yeah. He wonders whether you're aware of this. And so what view would you take of that? Um, specifically uh, of, uh, of the, the view that uh, Bronze Age lifestyles. Uh, I think he means the absence of, uh, of uh, hierarchical structures. Yeah, I mean, there are, there's certainly a number of groups um, that are known archaeologically today, and I think we're finding them. Well, uh, Middle Eastern or Near Eastern archaeology, as it used to be called, it used to be excessively focused on what I used to call this succession of empires approach, which basically they dug up imperial sites and you know secondary imperial sites and were less concerned with marginal cultures. Um, and of course, some of these marginal cultures actually were nomadic um, and um, actually did practice pastoralism more than farming. And, um, and people are people are finding that McCorriston is referring to Joy McCorriston, who's actually a Subsistence strategy specialist. Uh, what was the first name? McGee. McGee, McGee and McCorriston. Oh, McGee. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm more inter I, I'm more acquainted with Joy McCorriston's work because she's a colleague of mine, and um, I've been reading her work for a while. But, um, but yeah, I would say that that is actually a pretty uh, a pretty good estimation of the type of the way of life that these uh, these people had. And again, you know, when you think of uh, uh, the, the whole idea of whether they're indigenous to the Middle East is kind of silly. I mean, in, in that aspect, because they, they're not an ethnic group. Uh, they're not, um, uh, they, they've been practicing this way of life for thousands of years. And I think uh, it, we're, we're seeing more and more evidence of their influence as well. Um, um, he mentioned the Hurrians, right? Or was he talking about the Hurrians? Uh, no, it's the Aldurian concept of. Oh, 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 okay. I, uh, yes, okay. I said, yeah, oh, I misheard that. Okay, yeah, I, I, and I do think that that is, um, there's certainly a, enough evidence to show the antiquity of, uh, of this way of life. Okay, um, I've just got a meta comment here from Gillian Fulger. Uh, I, I think uh, Gillian's discovered uh, another cultural universal, apart from misogyny. Uh, elders in every culture seem to see a breaking down of tradition and group coherence. I don't know whether you'd like to um, meta meta comment on that. Oh, well, yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah, well, 
Well, what we're feeling, as someone pointed out earlier, is it's being replaced by nationalism, patriotism, all these concepts that I never could understand. <laughs> and um, so, you know, I, I and I think it's uh, it's partly this is reinforced by fairly powerful government structures and um, and this kind of in, in America we have we have uh, people who are who are really involved with trying to increase our group feeling as Americans and patriotism sometimes it goes overboard as we've seen recently but uh, but you know this is the project of uh, of modern nationalism so it can be expected. So. Okay, we've just got uh, a minute or so left, uh, Sandra. Mm -hmm. I wondered if I might risk um, what I hope is rather a small question. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Islam, but you didn't say all that much about it. What, what kind of an interface is there between these fascinating practices of Asabia and Islamic culture? Oh, as, it, as, it, as it later merges with Bedouin culture. Yeah, that's it. Well, actually, I, I had actually uh, I had something to, to say about that, but I was afraid my time was running out for questions. But but the relationship between the Bedouin and Islam is um is very interesting. Um, yeah, Bedouin are not considered to be um, they're considered to be practitioners, uh, at least um, in areas uh, where, they're, where they still have um, areas like the Nakab. Uh, they're, they're, uh, their practice of Islam is what I would say uh, a bit secularized <laughs> and not very strict or orthodox. Um, this is not Saudi Arabia, obviously. So, uh, and, uh, and I think the relationship um, of the Bedouin in the past, uh, uh, with the with the religion, is exemplified by a number of different things. I mentioned dogs before, and I actually see that as kind of exemplary of uh, of what happened with um, uh, with the, uh, the the joining together of Islamic culture and Bedouin culture. That uh, very early on, they had to make provision for the fact that the Bedouin would not part with their dogs, <laughs> and especially the Salukis, which are considered to be very important dogs in Bedouin life. And there was uh, there had to be a specific um, uh, specific ruling in uh, that uh, allowed them to to keep their dogs as long as they didn't um, keep them as pets. Um, um, they do actually, uh, as far as the way Bedouin have revealed their their uh, this Luki especially, uh, they do keep them sort of as pets. They're quite fond of them, and there have been stories about someone, uh, a European traveler, who made off with. Uh, uh, tribal leaders, uh, Saluki, and basically was uh, was attacked by about 40 different desert tribesmen. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so it can be taken very seriously. So, um, but that, that's just a, that's just an example. I think they are still uh, the the better with the Nakab, especially, are not considered to be particularly religious. Uh, but I think that's changing a bit because uh, the thing is, everything that was part of their life before the Israeli government came along. Uh, is now being, I would say, sort of um, put some, um, I, I think um, that where it was dying out with modernity, um, because of government sanctions, they're actually sort of into hyperdrive to try to revive some of these ideas of the, of the past and to try to revive their traditions in certain ways that, um, I mean, they adapt to modern life uh, to some extent, it's, but it's a form of resistance, actually, just to, re to return. To, uh, you know, I don't want to serve in the army anymore. No better one will go into the army now. And I'm not going to, you know, acquiesce to this sort of thing. And I'm going to go back to the way my fathers and grandfathers lived. So, um, so this is their particular reaction. Um, I can't really speak to, you know, how, how better one elsewhere in the world uh, are, are being assimilated into national government. Okay, um, uh, I'm, I think we have to stop there, um, Sandra. The questions are still coming in. Uh, I've got another question uh, from Linda Crow, which echoes some thought of, of my own about uh, the relationship between nomadism and identity. I don't know if you know Judith Oakley's book on travelers. Mm -hmm. Uh, gypsies, mm -hmm. 
uh, and so on and so forth. But I, I'm, I'm afraid I really do, with apologies to Linda, uh, I'm afraid we really do uh, need to uh, save this one up later. Uh, I've had a lot of compliments, by the way, on the question and answer list, and I'd like to add to those compliments as well. Thank you so much you. Uh, for a fascinating uh, lecture. And I think the discussion, uh, if we had but um, well enough and time, would have gone on much longer than your lecture itself. However, don't forget, we can continue these discussions uh, in other ways. Um, thanks to you then, uh, Sandra. Uh, um, uh, from uh, your far off sh from our shore to your far off shore. Um, let me just one announcement. Our next IAS event is Chris Darglish's seminar from the same project, by the way, uh, which has the title Culture, Communities and Land Reform, which is next Monday, 1st of February, uh, from 1700 to 1800. So we look forward to Chris's paper then. Uh, and uh, with that, thank you, everybody, for your questions. Thank you, Sandra, for your wonderful lecture. And well, we'll see you, everybody, for coming. <laughs> see you all again <laughs> soon. Yeah. Thank you.